Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to the fourth uh, webinar of this uh, series that we have organized on challenges and responses in simulation modeling and beyond. It is uh, a pleasure to, to introduce you. Welcome everybody to the fourth uh, webinar of this uh, series that we have organized on challenges and responses in simulation modeling and Hello, beyond. good afternoon. It uh, is, welcome uh, everybody. Pleasure to, the, to, to introduce you. Uh, welcome everybody of the fourth uh, webinar of this uh, series. We have here that, today uh, with us, it's a pleasure to introduce three speakers. We have uh, Antonietta Mira from the University of uh, Svizzera Italiana in Lugano and from the uh, University of Insubria. Uh, also Andrea Di Gaetano, who is a researcher in the Institute for Systems Analysis from the CNR in Rome, and Jean-Philippe Picomal, professor in theoretical chemistry at Sorbonne University in Paris. Today we will have presentations uh, addressing complementary aspects of what we have uh, heard up to now, uh, associated to modeling the pandemics and also about modeling SARS using uh, MD and polarizable force fields. We'd like to say that this is the last uh, of this series of webinars. I, I hope this has been interesting and, and enlightening for you in these uh, difficult times. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to to use the interest uh, around COVID to, to try to understand how computational science in general uh, can provide uh, insight and can help and what are the challenges. And we have done this as we always do in, in SICAM by promoting scientific collaboration. Um, this, this is a, a new format for us. I think we, we will learn from it. And I also think that beyond this series, this will help us to provide new ways to engage with the community and to provide new ways to enhance scientific collaboration. Uh, because of that, uh, because this is the last one, uh, we, we will be grateful if you can take a bit of time to fill in a survey. Actually, if you go to the webpage of CCAM, uh, where we have the information about all these series, there is an entry that allows you to fill a survey. And this will definitely will help us to understand how to improve and what are future activities that we can engage. We will send an email with, with this link, but since you are now attending, maybe it's easier even for you just to try at the end of today. Uh, um, regarding the, how this is gonna develop today, as, you, as always, you can post your questions through the chat uh, in the YouTube page. And then uh, Sarah and myself who will be chairing today's session will take care of them and We'll uh, collect all questions uh, for the last Q&A session we will have with, with the three speakers. In case you have problems with the chat, you can always also send us an email to director at .org. And again, we will collect these emails, uh, the content of the email with the questions as well. The, these uh, sessions are recorded so that then you can also look at them later either through our YouTube channel, the CCAM's uh, YouTube channel, or also through our CCAM webpage. You can see today's session and also the content of the last three sessions. Okay, so without uh, taking much time from this introduction, I would like then to start with the first of uh, today's presentation. This is a presentation that will be, as I said, it was, it's about epidemic modeling and it will be shared between Antonieta Mira and Andrea Gaetano, uh, and it will be about modeling the pandemics. So please, uh, Andrea, now the floor is yours, whenever you want to start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, I will be the one starting. Um, my name is uh, Antonieta Mira, and uh, I will be uh, trying to answer a few research questions together with uh, Andrea. The questions that we, are, we have been working on uh, over the past uh, two months or so are multiple. We try to uh, assess the response of communities to COVID-19 pandemic to start with. 
We also tried to help decision makers um, managing the hospital uh, emergency. We tried to predict the spread of the pandemic and to study the effects of different lockdown entry and exit timing. And these last two points will be better addressed by uh, Andrea. So I will start describing a little bit the data that we build upon, then the models that are both statistical and epidemiological models and uh, conclude with some of the results. So the, the type of data that we build upon uh, are of uh, three nature. Uh, there are on one hand public data uh, collected by um, uh, many different uh, uh, governmental bodies. And uh, John Hopkins University uh, was uh, one of the first that um, made them um, publicly available in a GitHub repository. The drawback of this data is that uh, they are observational data and uh, I will uh, get back to this point later on. Then uh, we also have access to some uh, uh, private or proprietary data from uh, hospitals or uh, tests on uh, uh, virological tests. And sometimes those are sample based data. And this is a, a good from a statistical point of view. And then there are data that are typically uh, proprietary that have been made publicly available. Uh, for example, Google and Apple uh, disclosed uh, their mobility data in an aggregated form. So um, let me focus. Uh, on uh, John Hopkins University uh, GitHub repository that for each country that has been affected by, by COVID-19 reports the number of confirmed death and recovered. So the problem with this data uh, is related to uh, what we are uh, trying to measure. So there are uh, definitions that are not um, shared uniformly among countries. Uh, when the data is reported, because there are often delays uh, by the uh, govern governmental bodies that report these data, and uh, also uh, the issues related to the fact that those are observational data and therefore uh, they have some inherent uh, uh, assert assertainment biases. So uh, in particular, um, regarding the different definitions, on uh, February 13, China changed their reporting policies to allow clinical diagnosis of COVID uh, cases, for example, by CT scan. And this uh, caused an increase of 30% uh, of the reported positive cases in a single day. And you would imagine then uh, trying to uh, study this data with these big changes, it's not easy. And similarly, later on, China changed the definition of reported cases to confirm to WHO standards um, with respect to uh, symptoms-free positive cases that were originally not reported by China as cases. Uh, also, there are issues related to the fact that uh, Johns Hopkins University switched from their own custom list of country names to the official United Nations list and then switched again to US uh, State Department list and then finally uh, came back to some compromise between UN and US uh, list of nation names. And um, we kept an updated list of different country names which converts to a standard of three letter codes. And uh, this list has been used also by other projects. So uh, with respect to the ascertainment bias, uh, this is a bias that arises when data are collected uh, in such a way that some members of the target population are less likely to be included in the finite sample. And uh, with reference to COVID-19, this uh, affects both uh, data uh, related to infections and data related to deaths. In particular for infectious, uh, there, as, there are, as you know, asymptomatic cases that uh, are typically not reported as uh, COVID positive cases because they are not tested. Similarly, there are uh, cases with mild symptoms that might also get not tested or there are symptomatic cases that are recovered before uh, the testing time, and they also don't show up as positive cases. With reference to deaths, uh, we have uh, different uh, 
type of censoring, left and right censoring due to the people that died before they are being tested or that died after the end of the study. Um, and also there are deaths recorded as non-COVID-19 uh, through uh, clinical evaluation as uh, China used to do at the very beginning of uh, uh, them reporting cases. Uh, let me now spend a few words on the uh, Italian uh, National Institute of Health data, which is the data that uh, Andrea will be uh, using. So the uh, National Institute of Health provides a more comprehensive uh, data set for Italy, more comprehensive than John Hopkins University. And data is available uh, also at a regional and uh, municipality level. And the regional level data has extra information relative to uh, the one reported by Johns Hopkins University, because we also have the number of hospitalized uh, patients, both in regular wards and ICU units. And uh, we have uh, also the number of people that got tested and uh, in particular also the unique tests because this refers to the testing policies, uh, a person to be declared um, he, um, recovered has to test twice positive uh, within, within 10, 20, uh, 24 hours. So as for hospital level data, um, we have access to anonymized uh, data from one of the main hospitals uh, in Lombardy. And uh, for their patients, uh, we have uh, uh, the different conditions, uh, depending on whether they are in the emergency room, in regular wards, or, or in intensive care units, as well as their exit status, like uh, we know whether they are deceased, recovered, or transferred to another hospital, plus some covariates like age and gender. Um, and uh, we use this data for um, helping uh, the manager of the hospitals to better um, decide uh, how many uh, um, beds uh, to hold in regular wards for COVID positive patients and how many ICU units to uh, build uh, and in to increase their capacity. And finally, we have uh, Google and Apple mobility data. Uh, I, those are aggregate data. And uh, in particular, Google uh, makes uh, uh, user location data anonymized, of course, available, which shows the change in activity near retail, grocery, pharmacy, parks, uh, transportation, workplaces, and uh, residential uh, locations. And generally, all these activities decline except for uh, home uh, activities. And here we have an example of the type of uh, Google mobility data. Uh, you see uh, Italy, um, who has a sharp decline uh, in their uh, mobility, uh, in its mobility uh, at about the time of lockdown. And now is slowly increasing, catching up with UK. And here you see Germany and US that are almost back to their baseline activity. So um, the next of uh, my time will be spent uh, uh, telling you about uh, uh, three types of models that we have been developing. Uh, first, a stochastic uh, susceptible infected and recovered type model that we um, model on the world data as reported by John Hopkins University. I will then spend a few words on a multinomial model that we use both for the Italian uh, and the data and for this uh, hospital data in Lombardy. And finally, uh, Andrea will tell you about a deterministic SIR type model uh, on the Italian uh, data organized on a network structure. So the work on the stochastic uh, uh, SIR model is joined with uh, colleagues from uh, Queensland University of Technology uh, David Warren, uh, Chris Durandi, and Kerry Mengerson, they are also part on a, of a Center of Excellence uh, for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers in Australia. And uh, there's also Anthony Ebert, uh, who is, uh, uh, like me, um, a member of the Institute of Computational Science at Università della Svizzera Italiana, and is uh, uh, specifically responsible for the data management, because managing data is really a big challenge. 
So uh, what is a SIR model? Well, it's a compartmental model where we have, uh, as the name of the model hints to, three compartments, susceptible, S, infected, I, and uh, removed, R. And we have some rate uh, parameters that governed the flow of people from one compartment to uh, another. For in particular, alpha is a transmission rate, beta is a remover, uh, removal rate. So if a susceptible and an infected um, um, person interact with some uh, transmission rate alpha, the susceptible becomes infected. And then with some uh, um, removal from parameter uh, beta, the infected person uh, recovers or uh, dies. R here stands for removal that uh, comprises both recovery and deaths. Now, uh, this is a, a, a discrete uh, state continuous time uh, Markov process. And to simulate it, uh, we use um, either exact or approximate uh, methodology. But the important thing is that this type of model for COVID-19 is far too simplistic to be realistic and to make uh, useful conclusions. So we uh, changed this typical formulation to um, include uh, other compartments. In particular, we consider susceptible, infected, and uh, part of the removed as an observable compartment. And we increase the model with some observable compartments like uh, active uh, confirmed cases, the uh, confirmed uh, recovery and the death cases. So those are the three compartments that we get data from the Johns Hopkins University uh, database. So we assume that uh, the alpha parameter stays uh, uh, as it was, but now it's a latent transmission parameter. Um, we have uh, an additional parameter, which is an identification parameter that tells us how uh, the infected uh, person are identified through uh, tests or swaps. And then we have a case recovery parameter beta and a case death parameter, parameter delta. And a fraction of the case recovery uh, parameter eta is the latent uh, removal that we don't observe. So the aim is to estimate those uh, rate parameters and this eta, which is a scale parameter. And um, we in particular model the community response. And to do this, so, um, we uh, let the transmission rate uh, between susceptible and infected to be a function of the observable, which are those uh, red compartments here. And uh, this introduces a feedback loop. And um, this uh, function, uh, this transmission rate, uh, which is a function G of the um, positive recovered and death uh, observable quantity, as a, a residual transmission rate alpha zero, and then a regular a regulated transmission uh, that includes another parameter alpha and this uh, function, which we take to be a function of some utility um, of the observable quantities. And the important parameter here is N, which is a strength parameter, positive parameter. And depending on the value of N, if N is zero, it means that uh, there was no um, regulation from the country. If N is uh, large, and bigger than one, it means that the country had low tolerance to um, the confirmed cases. On the other hand, if uh, N is uh, smaller than one and small, it means that the country had high uh, tolerance to the confirmed cases. So um, we take a Bayesian approach. So those are the parameters that we try to model, the data, uh, comes from the Johns Hopkins University uh, website. And uh, being Bayesians, uh, we put a prior distribution over the parameter vectors. We build a likelihood and the product of the prior times the likelihood gives rise to the posterior distribution, which is the distribution of the parameter 
once we have uh, observed the data. So the Bayes theorem allows us to update our prior knowledge on the parameter into a posterior distribution. Unfortunately, the posterior distribution is intractable because the likelihood itself is intractable due to the latent uh, population compartments that are not observed. So in order to make inference on uh, the parameter, uh, parameters of interest, uh, we resort to likelihood free methods. In particular, we use a methodology that is known as approximate Bayesian computation. And specifically, we use a, um, a methodology that was introduced by uh, Chris Trovandi, a co author in one of his papers, which is an adaptive um, um, SNC ABC, like, but you don't need to know the details. So, um, once we um, use our approximate Bayesian computation methodology on the model that I've highlighted, we can estimate for each one of the 103 uh, countries uh, independently. Those are uh, not all countries that uh, got affected, but the ones that by the time of observation had more than 100 cases. And we can estimate, uh, as you see here, in blue, the active cases, in red, the deceased, down here, and in yellow, the recovered. Now, uh, here in particular, you see two plots. The first one on the left refers to China, and the one on the right refers to South Korea. And I told you that in China on February 13, there was this big change in the way they reported the active cases, which is very clear uh, in this plot. And as you see, this creates problems uh, in how we estimate the model. Still, uh, the overall uh, trends are uh, sensible and sufficient for our purpose, which is compare how country reacted um, in their response to COVID-19. So these are the results uh, of our analysis on March uh, 31st. In particular, we report the estimates together with the 95% credible intervals of the key parameters of the model. In particular, here you have the identification rate the response strength and uh, a parameter K that I haven't introduced uh, yet, which is the ratio of undocumented cases to active cases at the first day of observation, which is the first day where the country uh, went over 100 confirmed cases. Now in this plot, each dot is a country and in red, you see countries that have a large number of cases, the <coughs> 10 uh, countries that uh, by the 31st of March had the large, largest number of cases. And you can see in the far left plot that uh, most of these cases have a small value of N and a large value of K. Remember that N is the response strength. So those countries reacted um, slowly or not sufficiently strongly to the number of um, uh, cases. And uh, they also started off with a large uh, ratio of an undocumented to active cases. On the other hand, in green, you see countries that did recover quickly. And for example, in particular, let me point out to China and South Korea down here. And those countries um, are characterized by a quick recovery uh, due to a high gamma, gamma remember is a identification rate, and a low value of K. So uh, we um, redo the analysis uh, later on, on 13th of April, and this highlights the dynamic nature of the problem. In particular, for example, you see that uh, Great Britain, uh, that was one of the uh, badly affected country moves from up here uh, in the first plot to down here together with uh, Germany, Spain, USA, uh, Italy, France, um, and Turkey, which are the most affected countries. We can also recover uh, the reproduction number from our analysis, and uh, we can see that many of the most affected countries are significantly, significantly over time reducing their reproductive number. So uh, to sum up this uh, research line, uh, we managed to quantify and characterize the community response to COVID-19 worldwide uh, by using a general recovery, uh, regulatory mechanism uh, resulting in a, a 
feedback loop in the uh, typical SIR model. And uh, we see that many countries with large case numbers had a low value of this regulation parameter that enters in this uh, regulatory mechanism, uh, which makes sense. On the other hand, uh, rapid recovery corresponds to high identif identification rate and low initial undo uh, undocumented uh, case number or case ratio K. Uh, overall, most countries are uh, showing sign of a reduction in the effective reproduction number. And what's interesting in this uh, general framework uh, is that uh, through the Bayesian approach, we can uh, take prior information into account. We can produce uh, credible intervals and measure the uncertainty in our inferential process. This paper is uh, available as a print print uh, preprint on uh, the med archive. So the last few minutes uh, of my uh, time, I want to spend uh, telling you about a statistical model. So the first one was uh, more an epidemiological model, but uh, since I am a statistician uh, and I'm more used to statistical model with uh, the colleague Professor uh, Francesco Bartolucci from Perugia University and uh, Fulvio Pennoni from Bicocca University, uh, we uh, uh, estimated a Bayesian multinomial autoregressive model um, on the Italian data. So the Italian data, remember, gives us a time series for the uh, susceptible, the infected, distinguishing between uh, people quarantined at home hospitalized with symptom and hospitalized in intensive care unit, and they're removed, uh, distinguishing be between recovered and death. So because some of those counts are less prone to measurement errors, we decide to model all of them jointly uh, through a multinomial uh, autoregressive model with a hidden first order um, Markovian structure following a earlier paper by Francesco Bartolucci, uh, who also published a book uh, on um, hidden uh, Markov models. We then use Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation um, for some of the unobserved uh, daily transition uh, between those categories. So we assume that we have some sort of contingency table where the marginal uh, are fixed and are given by the time series reported by the National Institute of Health, and we estimate the transition probability of moving from one category to another. For example, if you're hospitalized with symptoms, what is the probability or the transition from uh, this category to um, uh, intensive care unit or to recovered or to dead or quarantine, uh, quarantined at home? Uh, again, this is a, a, a statistical model where we take a Bayesian approach that allows us to use prior information that we gather from medical doctors that tell us, for example, that patients in ICU units, especially at the beginning of the period, have a, a only 50% chance of uh, uh, recovering. Uh, we, we estimate this model for Lombardy and Italy for three time periods, um, and we can predict for each category the future counts together with the confidence intervals, um, or credible intervals to be precise, and we do also backtesting to assess the predictive performance. And these are the type of graphs uh, that we produce for each one of the categories, recovered, quarantine, hospitalized, intensive care, disease, and uh, current positive. Um, the, 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 um, the straight, the lines are data, and then this is the end of the observation period, and we forward uh, predict uh, for each one of the categories the counts together with confidence intervals. This is the first observation period. This is the second observation period uh, later on, where we start seeing a decline on the uh, current positive uh, people. A very similar model uh, is used on the hospital data. Here uh, we have time series on people in emergency room hospitalized with symptoms um, uh, in um, intensive care unit. And then uh, for the uh, exit, uh, we have the recovered, the transferred to other hospitals and the deceased. The difference between this data is that we were given uh, 
data for also the transit between each one of those uh, status. So we didn't need to reconstruct the uh, transition matrix because this was um, recovered from the data. And again, for each category, we managed to predict the counts. For example, uh, this is uh, data until uh, a couple of days ago. And for each one of the categories, we cr can predict how many people uh, will there be tomorrow and next week and in 15 days, for example, in uh, the ICU units. And we see that there is a decline. So the general director of the hospital can decide uh, that he can free some of these IC units and uh, start opening some uh, uh, surgery uh, units um, and go back to normal. So these are um, a different type of models uh, for um, uh, regular wards and again, uh, intensive care unit. So this is it for um, my analysis and I hand uh, the stage uh, over to Andrea. Hello. I don't know whether you can see my screen. Uh, several models have been built over the uh, past few weeks to try and describe uh, the the COVID pandemic. We don't see your screen. We, you do not see my screen. You right. should see a map of China at this point. No, we don't. All right. Let me try again. Yes. Okay, great. So several models have been used and been written over the past few weeks to describe the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is, for instance, one of the very first um, comprehensive models which were published by a group with uh, people at Imperial College in China and in the United States. About um, 375 provinces in China with a regional structure linking the evolution of the pandemic in each of the nodes of a network of separate uh, cities and districts. Uh, later on, a similar multi-regional approach was followed for Italy. Uh, you can see the data here arrive until March 23rd. Uh, and here again, the idea was let's take a few, um, a few nodes, a few regions or cities, regions in this case, let us link them um, with uh, communication links, which of course carry infection as well, uh, and let's see what the evolution is. Um, in this particular paper, which appeared uh, on the FNAS, uh, the authors actually try to model the epidemics, but not the care. Uh, they don't take into account what happens in the hospitals and the ICUs and uh, what happens to patients when they're, once they are diagnosed. Another um, later paper did a essentially the same thing. But in this case, um, the regional structure was not taken into account. Uh, and again, no attention was given to um, the distribution of care to the patients. So at this point, uh, this point uh, Antonietta, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, we tried to put together our paper, disregarding the fact that there have been many, 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 many papers published over the, the past uh, very few weeks uh, on COVID-19. And what we did was, well, let's include the original structure. So we will consider uh, macro regions in Italy. Uh, let us build a deterministic SIR model in the sense of susceptibles, infected, recovered, exposed, et cetera. Um, let us add some relevant um, compartments, like for instance, a population reservoir. If you live on top of a mountain, even if the virus is very infectious, you're unlikely to get infected yourself because you don't mix with people in the cities um, who live nearby, near hotbeds. So there is a segregation of the population which 
is important in determining out of the total population, who is susceptible for real and who isn't, and other things, asymptomatic individuals and things. Um, we arrived with our analysis until day 74. Uh, we tried to include what actually happened in hospitals and in ICUs, how care was delivered. And we could do this because as Antonietta said, uh, the Italian uh, Civil Protection Department daily um, distributes counts of people in hospital, in ICU, uh, number of swabs administered, number of people tested positive, et cetera. Okay, <clears throat> in order to link the regions, we had you know, to hypothesize some kind of geographical connection. And we did this with this idea of, a, of an adjacency matrix where um, one region, for instance, Emilia-Romagna is neighboring another region, which is for instance, Lombardy, and depending on the strength of the link, infected patients in Emilia-Romagna are effective in infecting people in Lombardy and vice versa. A number of features which you are not really interested in knowing. <clears throat> and the point is, we came to write this rather complicated model. And, and the, the gist of my, um, of my presentation today is to try and highlight what the difficulties are when you're trying to build something which bears some resemblance with what actually happens instead of just living in the theoretical world, which is so dear to practice in mathematicians. If you're a mathematician and you build an SIR model, you are interested in a very, um, uh, I can say fascinating concepts like for instance, uh, uh, equilibria states or uh, persistency or this kind of stuff. And you may want to explore these mathematical constructs depending on conditions like, for instance, state dependent infectivity rates and, and, and such. And you build a very nice mathematical model, which however, does not describe the situation. When you try to describe the situation, you start with a simple um, set of building blocks. Let's take an SIR model, susceptibles, infectives, and removed. Is this enough? No, of course it isn't. So there is geographical, um, uh, a geographical factor affecting uh, mixing of uh, different regions and cross infection. So add the adjacency, fine. Is this enough? No, it isn't. Uh, so add the as population segregation. Is this enough? No, it isn't. So now you add the, the fact that some asymptomatic individuals as asymptomatic may infect people. You add the fact that the people who are symptomatic actually have symptoms. They are admitted to the hospital and presumably isolated there so that their infectivity rate is less than the infectivity rate of asymptomatic individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you end up with a rather complicated model. And uh, <clears throat> I will not describe the model that we uh, actually built. Um, let me just show you a couple of graphs. Um, this is for, for some um, uh, relevant variables, for instance, left uh, to right, top to bottom, the number of swaps administered, which are fitted, of course, in, for, for each graph you see in color, the six different macro regions that we represented. You see dots, they are the, actually, the actual observations and the lines through the dots are the model predictions. And you see that, of course, the number of swaps is a simple thing to predict. We could do this essentially perfectly. Um, top right, we, we managed to represent the total number of cases very well. Uh, and then we start uh, having problems like uh, center left, the total number of people in quarantine at home and center right, total number of people at, in the hospital and in the ICU, bottom left, active cases, bottom right, the actual deaths. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is for instance, the green curve in the center right graph. 
that is Lombardy. And that is the actual, you know, the dots are the actually observed um, number of people admitted to hospitals. And if you look at the at how points um, distribute, you will see that there is a distinct corner, if you will, um, about day 38 after the beginning of the recordings, which is February 31st. And then there is a flat stretch and then a decline. And the flat stretch is due to the fact that in effect, during that period between days 38 and uh, 55, the um, uh, care capacity of Lombardy was either met or exceeded. Uh, so that many more patients were sent home in quarantine than were admitted to the hospital. And the point is that your model ought to be able to reproduce that. In fact, our model includes things like people sent home because there are no places in the hospital. And these people, of course, fare worse. Um, okay, so one of the problems is this. Um, if you have the model, and the equations are actually able to represent the phenomenon. And then you fit the model with some numerical scheme, ordinary least squares, weight least squares, maximum likelihood, whatever you want. Typically, you don't get a nice recovery of those features which you think are qualitatively obvious. If we talk to physicians, they would immediately see that of course, you know, your total uh, admissions go up until a point in which you know, there are no places anymore. And then they've stopped, the, the, the curve becomes flat. And as soon as the number of infections, you know, infected people goes down, you will have a recovery, uh, which is rather sharp in the beginning and you know, exactly what you see from the data. Now, the problem is that these kind of features are difficult to recover through totally automatic means. And this begs the question, uh, what, what kind of fitting or what kind of parameter estimation are we doing? Um, in a way, statistics may be defined as a mathematically correct extension of common sense. When uh, your friend, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, uh, drinking tea with his students decided 5%, is the uh, level of significance. He said that because, you know, by common sense, once an event happens once in a, a, every 20 times, it is rare. And his students jotted this down as 5% is the level of significance and we have used 5% ever since. So if a parameter estimate um, out of maximum likelihood procedure fails to capture a feature which you, by common sense, can clearly identify from the data. Should you trust your um, numerical algorithm? Or maybe should you give appropriate weights to the point so that the automatic algorithm can actually get the features that you want? But this is actually imposing in different ways um, your preconceived notion of what should happen onto the data. And this may not be wrong. Um, there are several ways that you can use a model. One way would be to predict blindly what's gonna happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. You use plain statistics to do that. And there are very sophisticated um, mechanisms to do that. Uh, but another way that you would actually use models is you try to represent with the model what you think ought to happen. If the model is not able to reproduce the data, then the assumptions that you have made, that you have made are not correct. You're using the model in a way as a tool to understand the mechanics. This is one such um, case. I will not bore you too much. This is the pandemic evolution with some uh, reasonable prediction margins given by uh, sensitivity analysis on the parameters of the model. Um, one thing that we know is that had the, the government in Italy 
not intervened so strongly, we would probably have had a very, very dramatic picture. But you can predict this with this complicated model or with other much less complicated models as well. Um, this is actually a comparison of what might have happened. And if you look just at the bottom right graph, this is the, um, this is the number of deaths if we, had, uh, if we had had no lockdown at all, we might have had in Italy about uh, 100,000 deaths instead of the 20 something that we had. Um, and this is it. I guess I'll stop here. Thank you. So Antonetta and Andrea, thank you very much for this uh, engaging presentation. I now think we is good to stop for say 10 minutes. So we recommend five minutes before four to start with the second presentation. And I remind you that you can keep on posting your questions both for Andrea and Antonieta on the YouTube channel, uh, top uh, in the chat uh, column and uh, as well uh, during the presentation of, of jean -Philippe. So see you in 10 minutes, bye.
Hello, welcome back to the second part of uh, today's webinar session. And we will start, as I had uh, mentioned, with the uh, first with the talk by Jean-Philippe Piquemal on molecular dynamics and uh, polarized or force field simulations. Please, uh, Jean-Philippe, whenever you want. So thank you for this invitation. So today I will uh, try to explain a little bit what we are doing in Paris concerning uh, the molecular uh, simulation um, dedicated to the COVID-19 virus. So this presentation will be a little bit an overview of uh, what we try to intend, intend to do. And uh, I will give you, give you some initial uh, results that we have. Um, we are uh, in the middle of producing the simulations. So um, what happened is uh, really special uh, because, uh, because of that pandemic, uh, a lot of things change in the HPC world and um, all the simulations we are doing, they rely uh, extensively on supercomputers, okay? And so uh, since the start of the, the problems in Europe and in the world, um, there have been a, a general uh, mobilization for giving access in fact to researcher to uh, large scale uh, supercomputer resources, okay? So uh, in my country, it has been, been done by GNC. At the EU level, you have PRICE, who did a lot of things. And uh, in USA, you have also uh, the same kind of movement and uh, a strong HPC consortium uh, has been built to answer, to try to answer uh, a few questions. So uh, our project is clearly uh, in link with all, with all these movements. And uh, we basically started uh, by answering some of these calls, okay? So I can take uh, 30 seconds to, to advertise for what is uh, organized in the EU. So especially if you are interested by getting access to this supercomputer, you have the fast track from PRICE. So PRICE is the, the general organization dealing with supercomputers in Europe. So it's a very short uh, answer. Uh, you can have uh, resources in one week and uh, many types of uh, uh, research can ask for such time, okay? By color uh, modeling, bioinformatics, biosimulation, epidemiologic, and um, any type of uh, research that could deal uh, with the uh, supercomputer and high performance computing. So that was uh, exactly the start for me and for my group. Uh, we replied to uh, one of these calls, actually to two, and uh, we got uh, some time to, to work. So it was already some time ago, and uh, why do we need that? So uh, we are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, molecular dynamics people. So uh, despite that we are a, a group in uh, quantum chemistry, we are developing uh, new generation molecular dynamics simulation and new generation force fields. And our goal was to try to uh, apply these techniques to the modeling of the COVID-19 proteins, okay? So the idea be being to, to extensively uh, um, simulate uh, these proteins in order to later be able to uh, perform virtual screening on the, the output of this simulation. So it was uh, already something in going because we were uh, extensively working uh, on HIV. So uh, process of an ERC project uh, that is, is involving uh, simulation on viruses. So to do that, uh, we got access to two nice comp supercomputers, uh, one uh, from HP called Jean Zay and the other one from Atos uh, called Jolie Curie. And both of them uh, will require, uh, have required a lot of effort at the HPC level. And uh, I will tell you a little bit more after the presentation of the, the COVID-19 uh, initial uh, work. So um, we were not alone. Uh, and, uh, and actually, we, we replied to, to this call with a, a series of partners uh, building a consortium. So 
And um, the difficulty with uh, COVID-19 is it is really difficult. So it's not only an HPC uh, story. You need a lot of um, knowledge in uh, biochemistry, structural biology, uh, visualization, uh, different types of physics, and even in uh, VECO biology, because you have a lot of glycans. So uh, we have been uh, uh, gathering uh, together uh, some close friends to try to, to understand and to simulate uh, at an atomic scale uh, these proteins. So, um, and also uh, we, we try to link our, our work to other groups because there are many projects in molecular simulation. And we have some actual uh, active collaboration with people uh, like Andres Cisneros or Rumi Amaro. So in a nutshell, what do we want to do? So mainly, uh, the, 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 at least for my group, because the, the other groups of the, of the consortium will do parts of the project uh, on their own, uh, is that we want to simulate uh, all the virus components, OK? So what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, we want to do simulation at an atomistic level. And uh, this simulation should, should be as precise as possible because we want to, 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 to add uh, uh, advanced uh, energy function to parisable force field. And that way, in order for it to be interesting for people, what we need is to have access to a lot of detailed experiments, okay? Because uh, it's really, really important to rely on the latest informations. And um, this information are coming slowly and uh, the pandemic uh, did not start uh, long ago. But so that's a big part of the process uh, when you are building a simulation starting simulation to make sure that what you are actually simulating has a sense, okay? And then based on the, this uh, extensive simulation, um, we would like to uh, virtually screen a lot of compounds. So uh, we are in the business of repositioning a drug. So that means that we are not designing a new drug. We are trying to, to check the existing drug for a potential activity to inhibit or to disrupt a specific target uh, within the virus. And that virtual screening is linked to our molecular dynamics E4 because we will use the output of this virtual screening uh, to actually uh, refine it. So uh, the initial days, so we, we, we started very early uh, in, the, in the process, uh, uh, we are mainly, in fact, uh, dedicated to scaling up our software because, as you will see, the, the coronavirus um, proteins are not small at all. They are very complex. So that means a very heavy HPC simulation and uh, the need of a lot of tools. So uh, I will tell you more in detail at the end what we did for the uh, molecular dynamics code, but it was not only limited to the polarizable uh, MD, it was also uh, requiring uh, modifications of our visualization tool. So we have this VTX uh, visualizer and also from our virtual screening strategy because we need to, to spring a lot more compounds that uh, in a regular situation. And of course, uh, you will see that the, the complexity of the virus is bringing uh, questions about the parametrization of the force field, because for example, the, the lichens, which are sugars, are not uh, widely used and widely uh, available. So that many questions has been uh, introduced by the, the simulation of these viruses. So uh, the difficulties are, it's, it's important to, to tell the people what are, where the difficulties. First, uh, people have to remind that uh, we were all in lockdown until yesterday. So, the last two months, uh, this work was a human adventure because uh, the group was uh, scattered uh, in all over the place in France, but pe other people were in US uh, in all over the place. So first, uh, I think that's been an issue for um, a lot of scientists. Uh, when, when you work in the middle of the pandemic, uh, it's first without funding, and second, you need to rely on what you can do. And that's what exactly what happened to us. As I said, um, beside this organizational issue, um, you need experimental data. And uh, the problem is exactly the same for the, 
the experimentalists, uh, they are producing data and they have to share, to share them. And uh, um, not everything is available because not everything is finished. And uh, on what is available, sometimes you have incompleteness. That means you have old structures, you have to rebuild parts of the system, you have to, to guess uh, some, uh, some residue. And so that's, that's a lot more than just uh, running MD. Um, basically, if you don't check your structures, uh, nothing will happen seriously uh, because um, there is an initial work which is uh, really important. And I will try to explain uh, what we have been doing there. Uh, second, as I said, uh, the simulation are large. So we are talking about uh, millions of atoms simulation. So uh, it's not something that you can do uh, uh, in, a, in a few hours. And these are weeks and months of work. And uh, again, uh, that's a lot of data uh, to be sure of before uh, launching the big simulation. And then the, also that's a real life situation. So that means that the system is real, is, is in its full complexity. So you have uh, ions, uh, like divalent ions, you have uh, anions, you have uh, various uh, types of uh, structure that you need to, to parameterize. Uh, as you will see, uh, it, is, it is a virus. So the virus is uh, covered with glycans. So the, the, the glycans are certainly not among the easiest uh, uh, residue to, 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 to model uh, in molecular dynamics. So lots of pitfalls uh, that, uh, that could bring to, to a failure of the simulation. So what is sure is if your model is bad and your simulation itself is bad, you will never get the right answer. So there is a little bit of, a lot of, uh, not a little bit, a lot of uh, check to do before launching the simulation. It's a little bit like, like the space shuttle. Uh, before um, uh, simulating, uh, uh, better be right uh, on the different aspects of the setup of the simulation. So that, that's a lot more uh, time and uniform that uh, one could uh, uh, think about uh, usually. Um, that's a very daunting challenge. So especially because uh, I'm focusing on uh, why do we need this target so accurately, it's because that, uh, by the way, uh, basically the, the, um, at the end, what we are doing is a ligand target complex, okay? So we just want to, to play Tetris. And um, if your target is wrong, you have little chance really to, to get the right answer. So you see, it is as simple as that. And uh, it's uh, always scary to see uh, the databases screened in a, in, a, in a day on random uh, targets. Yeah, probably it has no sense for me. So the one issue then is, okay, we do that. Uh, what do we want to, 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 to target on the COVID-19? So as you see the, on this video, uh, the COVID-19 is a, uh, a big ball of uh, membrane uh, of lipids, and uh, you have uh, these uh, spike proteins around around these lipids, like the the, the, the peaks that you see that you see there. And uh, these peaks uh, uh, are really important because they are the one that will uh, actually uh, promote the capability of the virus to to link to you the human cells. So these spike proteins are really important, but inside and on the surface, you have also many uh, proteins. So um, the key is the, the potential target are really large. You have a large number of proteins, more than 20. So even some of them, we are not sure what they are doing completely. So some of them uh, are well uh, understood. They are uh, analogous to the previous uh, SARS virus from 2003. Uh, I took that, uh, that table from uh, one of the paper, uh, recent paper published, because it, it is illustrative of uh, what we have to, do, to deal with. So we know that there is a protein, and then you need a structure. You need a PDB extracted from whatever uh, high accuracy experiment. And from, for some of them, from some of them, you don't have uh, yet the crystal structure, okay? So you, you can work on uh, the data you have, uh, and this data, then you have to, to check them, to analyze them, 
uh, to, to cross the, the different source of um, information that you have with the, the different sequences, the X-ray with cryo EM, um, and also with, with your uh, knowledge from, uh, I would say, uh, molecular modeler in order to, to be able to, to, to bring a solution. So that's sometimes uh, not really uh, easy and not really obvious. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, you, you have here a, a, a list of the action that the virus will do uh, when it interacts with a cell. And the, the initial uh, step from the virus is this interaction with the uh, ACE2 uh, receptor at the surface of the human cell. So it's uh, clearly uh, an important target uh, to if one wants to to stop uh, the virus entrance in the virus uh, into the cell. And um, that's our main target uh, in, uh, in this project. Uh, I will show you more. And actually, we are starting uh, more different, very different targets with some experimental lab. But I will focus in my talk on the spike and just after uh, on what would be the protease. But uh, this uh, spike uh, protein is uh, really fascinating because it, it's very complex. So uh, the spike uh, protein uh, will link to this uh, ACE2, which is the angiotensin 2 converting enzyme. And this enzyme is not supposed to be linked to a virus. It has a lot of purpose in your body. And the, already the simple uh, linkage of the virus with the ACE2 is already uh, giving you a strong perturbation into the organism. So the idea is really to understand the spike uh, protein to uh, obtain a very high resolution model uh, in interaction with the ACE2 receptor. So it has been the start of our project. So we have been collaborating uh, a lot with the Pasteur Institute in Paris and uh, with the people at UT Austin in Texas. So there are multiple questions. So first, uh, and maybe you, you, you heard about, uh, one of the main uh, characteristics of this virus is it, it is very strongly linked to the ACE2 receptor. But when I say strongly linked, that means a lot more than the his ancestor, the, the, the first uh, SRAS uh, virus. Okay. So we need to understand, it's not yet completely understood, what are the, the at the, I would say, the atomic level, uh, the physical origin uh, of um, uh, this uh, very strong interaction. And by doing that, uh, we have to reopen the question of the previous virus, because um, in order to understand that, you need to, to, to completely uh, uh, compare um, the virus one to the virus two, actually. And the key feature for molecular modeling is the presence of glycan. And you will see an animation in a few slides. Uh, when you speak about uh, the spike protein, you, you, you have to deal with a, a protein which is, uh, is in stealth mode. That means that it is covered with glycans. And the glycans are a, a way to, for the, the virus to hide itself from the human body. But these glycans are not simple. They are complex. And they are moving really fast. So that means that in cryo EM, uh, you don't really see them. Okay. So uh, since you don't see them, you have to, to resort to other means to, 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 to have a, a complete model of, of these um, proteins. And of course, uh, the spike is far from being a, a, a simple. Um, a simple uh, protein. It has conformations. It can be open or closed because it will try to grab basically the receptor, like uh, not really a machine, but it's moving. You have a part of the uh, a part of the protein which is closing, and that's also something that uh, it has, which has to be really understood at the level of the of the, the molecular simulations. So, um, what do we do? So. In practice, so we have launched in fact uh, two different projects on the spike using two different models. So uh, the first model is the one we started from day one, is a model uh, which is not encompassing the full spike. It's only using the, 
the RBD, which is the receptor binding domain. That means the part of the spike which will interact with ACE2. Okay, so that in a nutshell, that's the head of the spike, and that uh, that head of the spike uh, is strongly interacting uh, with what you see on the left on the on the on the picture, which is the grape uh, area, which is the receptor on the human cell. So what we try to do is to uh, do MD on that, but not only to do MD, just to do MD. Uh, we we try to to evaluate with very robust the the the, the strong uh, interaction. So because in the literature you you have a, a lot of values for this interaction and they are all different. And here we are launching a very massive uh, uh, accelerated sampling uh, study to really recompute the potential of mean force using polarizable, polarizable force field, uh, uh, the polarizable force field amoeba of this um, RBD interacting with ACE2. So that means uh, a huge number of computation. So we are talking about microseconds of polarizable simulation. So it started. And uh, we hope to be uh, able to, to, to compare actually uh, the, 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 the first virus to the second and to try to understand uh, in really in lots of details uh, what's going on. So the second uh, model is uh, 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 that's something that will, uh, has not been built by us. It has been built by Romy Amaro at UCSD. And um, that's the I would say one of the most complete model of the spike alone. So that's the spike plus the membrane, including uh, all the, the glycans. So in our previous model, it was not obvious of my, on my previous slide, but you, we have only a limited number of, uh, of glycans because most of the glycans are not exactly in the area we are, we are looking at. So in the spike, the global, uh, uh, you, you have several dozens of, um, of glycans and these glycans, as I said, uh, they, they, they are really difficult to, to characterize uh, experimentally. So that would be uh, uh, a way also to try to understand uh, uh, the role of these glycans at the molecular dynamics point of view and uh, to, to go towards the complexity uh, of the virus alone. So already before it was starting to be a big system. It was 1.6 atom, million atom. But then uh, when you move to the food spike plus the membrane, you are more than doubling uh, the size of the system. So, which is pretty far from the full virus because the full virus is more than 250 million atoms. Uh, there are not yet atomistic model for that, uh, but uh, maybe one day uh, there will be. So the modeling objective of this uh, spike uh, like a study is to, uh, sam to sample massively uh, the, the, the spike protein because there are lots of questions that will uh, interest the people in virtual, in virtual screening. And what we want to do is to, to do a clustering of this ensemble of position. So that's what we are actually doing now. And uh, if we have a very high resolution uh, landscape of the, of the potential energy surface, um, we can hope that the, the virtual screening will maybe find a more, um, more potent molecule because uh, if the surface is more accurate, uh, there is a chance that will, uh, it will bring uh, new information. So of course, the number of uh, ligands we want to dock is huge. So we won't be able to do it at the polarizable level, but the idea here is to do first, a first round of, of simplified docking function to re-inject them into a full polarizable model to do free energies. And of course, the final outcome uh, with that, and with some uh, collaboration with experimental labs, is to, to perform the biologic test on uh, what will be found. The second target, uh, which is uh, smaller, but not very small, is the, the, the MPRO uh, main proteins. So that's, uh, that's an enzyme, so you have uh, an active site, and so what we are looking at are inhibitors, okay? So uh, it is a dimer, so uh, it's uh, formed by two pieces. So on the left, you have the monomer, on the right, you have the dimer. And here, uh, the strategy is, uh, is uh, 
also based on uh, extensive uh, sampling, uh, we aim to, to really perform a, a lot of microseconds of AMOEBA molecular dynamics based on uh, also the clustering strategy uh, that will use a classical uh, MD simulation to be able to provide uh, starting points for the virtual screen. So here also, we observe that uh, actually the potential energy surface that we can find at, um, at the polarizable MD level uh, is different from the one uh, of classical first law. So that's a, a large scale test of uh, the advantage, uh, the potential advantages of the classical force, uh, the polarizable force field. And uh, we will see, because that this time there will be a, a lot of uh, volume of uh, MD produced, uh, what we can see, what we can learn from that. So overall, uh, it's like, uh, you know, um, uh, when you have a, a probe that want to land on the comet, you know, you re remember the Philae uh, landing site. Uh, it's a question about how to define this landing site. So my potential energy surface that I just discussed, uh, we hope uh, that it will be more refined and so that we would see uh, things that were not available before. And that's the, the whole interest of possible forces. So just to, to finish and to wrap up, uh, the, uh, this uh, has been, uh, been possible because the methodology has, a, has evolved a lot. So it was already a work in progress, but it was supposed to happen at the end of 2020. And what happened basically is the COVID-19 has been uh, forcing us to, to improve our software. So uh, the key things uh, of the, what we do is that uh, uh, the polarizable force field, they include uh, more, more end-body physics because they include that polarization term. Okay? And so that polarization term is really important when you have to deal, for example, with the um, uh, charge system and you have a lot of them in COVID. You have uh, various types of uh, ions, negative, positive, you have polarizable weather, so the weather is uh, really important if you look at the competition at the interface of the spike and the ACO2. And um, also, it's really important for QMMM. So we have some links with people doing some QMMM. So this simulation will also go to, to, to prepare uh, QMMM runs, and uh, that's a collaboration with Andre Cisneros in the US. So this uh, polarizable force field, they, they are different from the, the one you can find uh, usually. And, I think uh, we hope it will be uh, it will be bring something. So everything has been done with uh, our Q, uh, our Tinker HP code. So um, most of you probably know Tinker, and Tinker HP is the massively the parallel version of this code. So it has been designed to run on petascale uh, supercomputers. So you initially on CPU, and the big change, in fact, um, of this project. Uh, was to adapt, uh, in fact, uh, the, the software to uh, GPUs because all, all, all what is possible on the COVID-19 is uh, mainly, do, uh, uh, mainly possible because of GPUs. So, uh, and why do we need GPU? For example, you have a, 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 just an example of the energy form of AMOEBA. Uh, if you just look at the electrostatic, forget about all the other equations, uh, it's not Q, Q prime anymore. You have a lot of other terms. You have dipole, you have quadrupoles, you need to couple them, you have induced dipoles, uh, more uh, fancy uh, Van der Waals, and uh, that's uh, a cost. So you really need HPC uh, to do that. So it was uh, more or less on the for quite some time since uh, uh, we had uh, implemented the 3D decomposition uh, methods. So we have a framework for polarization that uh, is uh, an adaptation on what the show did for uh, the neutral territories. So we can completely distribute all the data across nodes and uh, various processors. But uh, the, 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 compared to what we, we, we could do, uh, one issue was the amount of data, uh, for resources we needed to, to perform this computation. So the, the massively parallel implementation uh, allowed, for example, to multiply by order of magnitude what we could produce in a day. So if you look what we were producing on, uh, on the 1 million atom system in 2016 and what we can produce now, it's uh, for order of magnitude. It's really good. 
So, uh, but uh, uh, COVID-19 requires, uh, as I said, to, to do millions of atoms. And uh, if we can uh, run some of the simulation on, uh, on CPU centers, and we are actually doing that, it's more to prepare them because uh, uh, beside the, the size uh, of the system, the time scales are really important. Uh, you need to sample a lot, okay? So beside the HPC, uh, what we are using is, uh, I would say it's an algorithmic speed up. So we are using specific multi-time stepping uh, uh, schemes um, for, for those who are quantum chemists who are using range separation for polarization, who have short range and long range. And that thing basically is enabling to accelerate in, in, in addition to the HPC, uh, a lot of things in the simulation. So clearly, uh, the, one of the couple goal of this uh, COVID-19 project was to put in production uh, uh, a very heavy version of uh, TinkerHP to, to, to be able to, uh, to deal uh, with these proteins. And, um, the code that started to be in production uh, last month, and that's still not the development code because the development is faster, is uh, basically uh, eight times faster than the code we were using uh, before the, the lockdown. So that's a big change, and that's what has been uh, used uh, to, and what is used now to, to produce uh, all this simulation. So that's an idea of uh, uh, what the code is producing. So these results are, few weeks old uh, on the DGX2 uh, NVIDIA machine. And uh, uh, remember, uh, you probably don't remember, but uh, on uh, this uh, small virus, one million atom virus, uh, our best performance on, uh, on CPU using uh, 16,000 cores, the latest uh, Intel uh, was about a little bit more than 1.2 nanosecond, but with GPUs, and that code is not even the fastest one yet, uh, we, we can, do more than the double on, the, on a reasonable number of, of GPUs. So that means that uh, if we can do that with a, a few cards, if you have a machine with a lot of cards, and that's what, actually what is happening in France since the machines have more than thousands uh, GPUs, you can multiply the trajectories and you can really deal with this uh, ex extensive uh, sampling uh, studies uh, on complex proteins. So that's what I meant. Uh, we can use on rod of GPUs uh, to really do a petaflopic petaflo simulation um, on this system. And uh, luckily, uh, both machines on Jean Zay and Joe Lucuri uh, have uh, uh, the on rod uh, GPU cards. So uh, that's uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to say. So the important thing is that uh, the COVID-19 research is really uh, an interdis interdisciplinary decathlon. You need a lot of uh, knowledge in uh, various sciences. It's not only theoretical chemistry or biophysics. You need a lot of physics. You need a lot of applied maths, a lot of HPC. And uh, that's um, really something uh, which uh, is uh, non unusual uh, because uh, the virus is uh, extremely complex and uh, difficult to model. I would just finish by uh, thanking my team. Uh, so especially uh, the people who did the computations uh, and uh, the engineers uh, who have been uh, performing uh, wonderful jobs. And uh, thank you, I thank everybody for that. Thank you very much. Okay, Jean-Philippe, uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, after this presentation now, we will move to the a final common uh, question and discussion session with uh, all three speakers. And I just pass the word to Sarah Bonella to start chairing this last session. So thank you, Ignacio. And thank you to the speakers and to our audience. Uh, has, as usual, you've asked several questions. I have to confess straight away that I do not understand some of the questions asked for the first talk, so I will do my best to convey the message and then rely on Antonietta and Andrea to um, understand uh, more, more in detail what has been asked. Um, I also think that uh, we have um, some very focused and technical questions. Um, and then 
we may also try to take this opportunity, given that we have experts from seemingly uh, different areas of investigation related to COVID, maybe to foster some discussion or ask some more general uh, naive questions uh, about how to combine all these efforts that are going on at the same time. But let's start by biting the bullet, Antonietta. Technical questions for you. Let me start from the second one, which seems more uh, elaborate. I guess the gist of the question is, is the type of uh, modeling that you have employed, and in particular, the use of the ABC part of it, uh, really necessary for your SIR model? Yes. Well, thanks for the question. Um, this is something we have been uh, uh, discussing with, with uh, uh, my co-authors. And as a matter of fact, I asked for help, uh, you know, like when in this uh, um, uh, TV, TV games, uh, okay, you ask for help uh, from home and this is what I did. Uh, but this is something, as I said, that we discussed. So uh, uh, Chris Trovandi who is currently in um, Brisbane on the other side of the world and Anthony helped me answer uh, this question. Um, so, um, basically, uh, we um, appeal to ABC for two main reasons. Uh, one is robustness, uh, and the second one is flexibility. So, uh, as I uh, pointed out, data is messy, um, and we are not trying to get a reasonable match to the overall uh, data, rather, we try to get a good match on um, overall. And uh, we can afford to do this with ABC um, and uh, it's hard to do with particle filters. So first robustness and second flexibility. Uh, so we can uh, um, change the form of the utility function and we can have this uh, hidden states and we can handle them uh, easily through ABC. Though it is true that we uh, may try to appeal to particle uh, MCMC to obtain exact uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, but as it is in our model, we do not have an observation equation. Um, we could introduce one and uh, turn to a state space model. Um, and uh, I agree that uh, um, this could get us a better approximation, but uh, particle filters can suffer uh, of high variance when the model doesn't produce a close match on every observation. And so the resulting uh, particle MCMC algorithm may be uh, very computationally intensive. As a matter of fact, we did even try to implement it and we didn't see uh, on, on a a uh, simplified version of the model and we didn't see much uh, gain. And this is why uh, we presented the result with ABC. But thanks for the question. It's interesting, it's something we thought about and we even tried. Thank you for the answer. Um, moving to Jean-Philippe, uh, I think that these very long trajectories that you are producing are extremely interesting for several members in our audience. And one question is, are is data or available now or will it be available? It will be available uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> so uh, we'll, um, we, uh, we have um, a storage, uh, EU storage called Phoenix that uh, where we can um, give access to people. And the link will be shared uh, on the BioExcel uh, GitHub, uh, which has been built with MolestSI in the US. So, uh, uh, will uh, make everything available. Okay. Um, going back to the uh, statisticians, I guess there is, um, it's interesting to understand predictivity. And so in particular, Antonietta, for your hidden market chain model, um, the quest there was one specific question about how the predictions of your first period observation compare with data in the second period of observation. <clears throat> but then maybe it would be interesting to broaden this discussion and include also Andrea to understand how confident you are when you come up with one of these models in terms of their predictive power. Uh, I mean, of course, there is a, an, an interval of confidence in the answers, but how do you 
build the ingredients that go into things that make you more or less comfortable with this type of modeling. So maybe we can start with Antonietta and then move to Andrea for, to address this point. Yes, thank you. I'm going to, uh, again, uh, share my screen if you allow me to do so. Um, because um, we did uh, do some back testing and cross validation with uh, the uh, multinomial um, hidden Markov model. So, um, how do how we how did we compare the results? Well, uh, we as usually uh, as it's usually done in cross validation, we pretend to uh, go back in time, only see part of the data predict ahead of time and then compare the predicted values with the realized values with some sort of a, a chi-square distance measure. So for each one of the six categories um, of observation, the six time series that we uh, observed from the Protezione Civile or um, Ministry of Health data, uh, we compare the um, uh, observed with the predicted uh, squared divided by the predicted some over all six categories, and then some over uh, the five period of times that we predict ahead. So, um, so we, we predict one day ahead, two days ahead, all the way to five days ahead. Okay, so this is a distance measure, which is typically used for um, back testing. And uh, let me show you um, the results. Um, so this is the data. Uh, referring to Italy, okay? And um, so we have uh, uh, three periods of time and for each period of time, we do this uh, five uh, days ahead prediction and we sum up over the error over the five days and the categories for each one of the categories. And this is the total. Well, first of all, uh, as expected, as we gather more and more information, so between period one, two, and three, the total discrepancy measure goes down, which is what we expect. Uh, the other interesting thing is that overall, the discrepancy measure is quite low, especially for some of the categories that we care about for um, hospital management, in particular, uh, intensive care units and hospitalized with symptoms. Uh, well, like for example, for intensive care units in the third period, we make an error of zero. We get it exactly right. So this is for the uh, model uh, on the Protezione Civile uh, data. Uh, we did a similar type of comparison for the hospital data. Here, the categories are slightly different. Uh, we predict 10 days ahead. We compare with the observed results. So this again, in the back testing uh, um, uh, framework. Uh, the categories here are uh, dismissed, uh, emergency room, hospitalized uh, in um, regular wards, ICU, deceased, and transferred. So these are uh, absolute um, errors. They are not uh, chi-square distances. But again, you see that the error that we make, even 10 days ahead, is very small for the specific categories that they really care about, which are um, ICU units and uh, um, uh, hospitalized, uh, uh, sorry, here's the ICU, hosp and hospitalized with symptoms and emergency room. So we're, we were very happy with those results and also the um, hospital uh, and general director and managers um, told us that um, before getting this analysis, they were really trying to guess uh, what would happen. And, and now they have at least some uh, guidance. Andrea, would you like to add comments to this? Uh... Well, actually, yes. <clears throat> and I beg to disagree completely with my esteemed colleague. Um, this COVID-19 pandemic has been a lesson in humility. Um, you can use uh, techniques. We have, you know, you just open any CRAN repository for R and you get n fold cross validation. You have AIC and BIC criteria for model choice. You get model averaging. You have a whole bunch of statistical techniques on hand, on tap, in order to be able to choose the model, which is best fits the data, a compute um, uh, confidence intervals, credibility intervals in the future, et cetera. But this is actually useless if you miss the 
mechanics of the problem. If you don't understand that, uh, say, a region may be nearing its uh, saturation point in terms of bed occupancy, uh, whatever forecasts you're going to make are meaningless. Um, the reaction of the politicians, of the administrators, have been uh, diverse. They have been diverse geographically and they have been diverse over time. Um, failure to understand the, what possible mechanisms may influence or determine the behavior of the data two weeks down the road means that we as quantitative scientists are of no use to politicians who are reasoning with the seat of their pants, which might be quite a good approach to the problem. Antonietta, rebuttal or? Well, actually, I, I, so what is the purpose of all these uh, uh, epidemiological or statistical models that we uh, try to build? Well, uh, to me, uh, the ultimate purpose uh, is to support decision makers. I agree with uh, Andrea that uh, to do this at best, we need to understand the mechanism that uh, drive our predictions and to take uh, into account uh, the, 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 the details um, in the data and in particular the um, ICU occupancy I mean, uh, um, I, we, we can even refer to uh, the, the document of um, the task force that is supporting the uh, Italian government that uh, made uh, some scenario predictions um, in terms of the number of uh, ICU occupancy without explicitly considering that there is an upper bound to the ICU uh, increase uh, in uh, um, in, in, in a country, in a region, and, and so on. So you have to take those details into account. But ultimately, is a model good or bad? Um, well, uh, how, how do you measure that? Well, to me, what the, the general uh, director of this hospital said uh, was really rewarding and paid for uh, all the effort that uh, we are putting into try to make some sense out of this data, taking into account all the biases that we are aware of uh, and knowing that uh, some of them are better taken care of and others are, are very hard to uh, even think of. So, I mean, these are very general questions that, uh, you know, I've been worked uh, on this data for the past uh, two and a half months uh, and having uh, questions you know, what is it they were doing? Why are we doing this? How can we better support decision makers? Well, we don't develop vaccines, we don't develop uh, uh, therapies or uh, diagnostic tools. Well, the best that we can do is try to support decisions with models that we trust. And well, one way to, to check whether a model is trustworthy or not is do this type of cross validation So to me, they're uh, still worth it combined with uh, a good understanding of what's going on. And um, yeah, but the, the, the Bayesian approach allows us to take into account uh, the prior knowledge expertise or the fact that, for example, uh, China entered into the emergency uh, a few weeks before us. And so building our prior knowledge on the Chinese data to um, uh, get at least uh, a rough idea of the parameters that do enter in our model, like the infectivity rate, the recovery rate, and so on, it's, um, it's very important because it allows us not to just uh, uh, you know, move in, in model space and, and in parameter space blindly, but to have some guidance for, from uh, experts and uh, uh, similar data. Thank you. I think this is a, a long and fascinating discussion that we will, of course, not be able to uh, push too much further today. Uh, switching to more familiar grounds, Jean-Philippe, there was some curiosity, given your focus in accounting for polarization in your models, 
about uh, your impressions about the relative importance of polarization effects versus charge transfer in modeling these kind of systems. Oh, uh, so we're using the Amoeba force field. So there is no charge transfer. Uh, but um, I would say uh, it is very important. So it, it is uh, in the next model called Amoeba Plus. So Amoeba Plus has uh, an explicit charge transfer term. Um, what I can what I can say is uh, uh, around metals, charge transfer is important for highly charged systems. Uh, first polarization is important, but if you want to even either, uh, to even uh, refine further the the, the model, uh, of course you can uh, include uh, charge transfer terms. So we have uh, our own uh, possible force field developed in the lab. Uh, besides the Moeba Plus, which is called SIFA, and it has a generalized many body uh, charge transfer terms. The problem is, is the cost of the simulation. So I'm already talking about uh, uh, millions of hours. So if you want to, to include explicit charge transfer, it will be probably uh, possible in a few years. Uh, but uh, regarding the urgency, uh, we, we, we kept <laughs> ourselves to uh, Thank you. Do you have already a feeling for how the water dynamics of polarization changes in models with glycans and in models without them? Is a so the glycans, uh, it depends what are you, you are looking, but they are really important. So uh, it's, uh, that's why we, we saw it from the beginning. And uh, it has been a, a long journey towards uh, having parameters for glycans. Uh, because they, they are important for, for the, the spike. So uh, I think uh, it's really uh, a key issue to have uh, the, the glycans at the right place and the, the right type of glycans. Because um, for, some, for some interaction, you don't need them. I'm not sure for ACE2, you really need them. But if you really want to, to, to do some virtual screening on the spike protein, uh, the glycans are everywhere. So they are uh, long chains. They are pretty flexible and they are forming cavities. And so uh, it's highly probable that some drugs will go there. So if you don't have them or if you are them uh, misplaced or badly modeled, uh, it could be an issue. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I have one curiosity for Andrea and Antonietta, which I mean, is only vaguely inspired by problems we've encountered in false fields, namely transferability. You mentioned the fact that uh, you were able to analyze data from China and use that to improve a prediction for a model for a situation in a completely different environment or a, a, a sufficiently different environment like Italy, for example, to uh, justify maybe the question, okay, but can we really learn from uh, data that comes from, from, from different sets in a situation like a pandemic. And this maybe goes back also a bit to what Andrea was saying, in the sense that depending on very specific details of local situations, you may need to feed extra information in data. So how, how does it work? Is it possible to handle these sort of things? Yes, thanks. Uh, this is very interesting. So basically the Chinese data uh, that we use to build prior information is informative for the very beginning of the uh, pandemic spread. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the way um, Italy and European countries uh, move along the uh, uh, pandemic trajectory does uh, bear some uh, substantial differences that are related to the uh, social distancing uh, measures that were enforced with different degrees in the Eastern and Western countries. Among other things, there's also the age structure uh, of the population, which is uh, very different, um, and very many other um, uh, quantities that do influence uh, the, the effect of the pandemic. But uh, when you have very, very little data, like at the, like the very first week, there was um, so little data available in Italy that in order to make any sensible prediction, having some prior information that we could take into account, uh, which as I said, 
the, 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 the starting of the pandemic was very similar in, in every country. And this allows us to borrow strength uh, from other countries. And by the way, when, when you use prior information into a Bayesian setting, you can also uh, incorporate in your inferential process how much you trust this prior information. So not only you can center your parameter values on what you have seen in other countries, but you can also uh, uh, express the degree of uncertainty in your prior belief. Okay, which can be uh, more or less at the beginning and as uh, the pandemic develops. This is, um, to, to me, one of the big pluses of uh, the Bayesian approach. You can borrow information, but you can also say how much you trust this uh, external prior information. And as, as I said, when data is very little, uh, your, your likelihood-based inference is, is not reliable. So basically the prior act, act, act as a regularization term in the likelihood. And that's, it, from a mathematical point of view, this is what happens. You, Andrea, anything you would like to disagree on? Oops. Is Andrea there? Andrea still with us? Andrea? And uh, now, yeah. Uh, yes, I think he's. I have he's... somebody. Yes, I, I can hear. Uh, I didn't. Anything you want to disagree on with me? No, I'm sorry. I, I had some difficulty connecting in this past few seconds, but I am sure that you said everything I could have dreamt of. So, <laughs> on this positive note, I think I may give the word back to Ignacio to see if there are more. Yes. Uh, but I mean, there are not uh, additional questions that have arrived in the last minute. I think we have uh, gone through all of them. Uh, maybe just, uh, I also have a curiosity building. I don't know if this is a more philosophical question, but in some of the discussions by in between Andrea and Antoniette, Andrea was expressing this uh, discomfort with existing models and the need to have more mechanical information. So. Uh, on more general grounds, I don't know if by doing all this effort that you have been describing to, to model pandemics for COVID, at least you can, you have learned something into what you consider would be uh, essential ingredients for a model to be trusted and be predictable in longer term, which I think it's a bit what you are more concerned about, Andrea. Uh, I may have some difficulty with the line, with the uh, internet connection, but if you can hear me, um, so I wonder whether your question is more on the side of learning something about COVID-19 modeling, pandemics, or learning about the modeling process. Yeah, I was learning about thinking the in the second, in the second part, yes. In the second part. Uh, well, uh, it, <laughs> It's a long story. I've been doing modeling only for 35 to 40 years, so I have not learned much. Uh, I'm okay, I'm afraid that this is. I think we are losing Andrea, no? Yes, I'm afraid that Andrea is no longer with us. Not honest. Deep Sorry. learning curve. So we are losing you, Andrea. Can you hear us? Uh, okay. I'm certainly sorry. Uh, it is me. No, no, I, I can see and hear you. Okay, and okay. So I think well, this has to happen, right? This is like the yes. last question in the last webinar of the series. Exactly. No problems until now, and then boom. But, uh, we have been managing well so far, but uh, I'm sorry because, uh, yeah, I think we will have to, to leave it here. We have been. And invite Andrea, Andrea. And again yeah. to answer all the questions that we were not able to ask this time. Exactly, exactly. Well, let, let me finish by thanking again the speakers for today's presentations and, and discussions. And for all of you attending and following these, these sessions that we have, these webinars around uh, computational and modeling approaches to uh, COVID and the challenges that they pose. I hope this has been engaging. It has uh, brought new ideas and has helped you also to think about or to be 
exposed to these problems. And as usual with all our SICAM activities, we hope to contribute to scientific uh, collaboration and uh, scientific interaction. And as I said at the beginning, this is a new, uh, also a learning process for us as SICAM. And I hope that this format can be helpful for, for the whole community. Uh, so I will finish here. I remind you that there is this, you can access, you're invited to come to the SICAM website. Uh, within the COVID page, there is a survey and it will be obviously very helpful for us to know, to have uh, feedback from you, to understand what has been most interesting in order to program future events of this sort. So with this, I, I will finish and thank you very much again for following us and stay safe. Bye. Yes. For the organization and Andrea apologizes his uh, yeah. connection just failed. It's a bit. pity, yeah. It has been a pleasure to contribute to your uh, series yeah. of webinars. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Antonieta. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye.